Well, good morning, everyone. So, on my way up, rather than saying I'm looking forward to your talk, everyone just said to me, you'll follow Jack. <laughs> I said, yes, I do. I've never been to the White House. I don't have any stories like that, I'm afraid. So we're going to just jump straight in, really, to our Bible study uh, so we can try and stay on schedule. Let's just pray before we do. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God of Israel, we give you thanks, we give you praise for this wonderful day, and we pray now as we open your wonderful word that you give us eyes to see all of the glories and the truths contained within it. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, I'll just briefly introduce you to the Ezra Foundation if you haven't heard. So the mission statement for the Ezra Foundation, uh, we really exist to encourage and facilitate the serious study of the word of God by producing resources that promote a biblical understanding of Israel in the plan of God. And therefore, my talk today will be themed around the issue of Israel and spiritual warfare, because if you're not aware, Israel is an area where you do see uh, a lot of spiritual warfare, and it's a vital uh, area that we need to have understanding with today. Uh, everything, really, we see play out in the world in front of us is, has spiritual warfare going on behind it. Uh, I call this the unseen war. Uh, Jack used the term just then, the unseen reality, very similar concept, uh, giving nod to Donald Gray Barnhouse's old commentary, The Invisible War, but we'll call it The Unseen War for today, and we are in Revelation chapter 12. So if you have a Bible, please turn there. If not, it'll be on the screens uh, behind me, Revelation chapter 12. This is one of those unusual chapters where we get to peer behind the veil and see into the spiritual realms of what is going on. It will help you understand much of what you see in the world today, much of what is happening in the news, and also what will happen in the future. And particularly in this chapter, we get the real reason for anti-Semitism. And I want us to dig into that a little bit together today. So let's turn and read from Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. It says, A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain, to give birth. And then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven, and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth he might devour her child. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So notice, it says immediately in verse 1 that this is a sign, a great sign appeared in heaven. This tells us that this is a symbolic or figurative reality, although it is conveying a very literal truth that we will get into. So this is using symbolism. So the task of the expositor is to try and understand what these symbols mean. And this is one of the reasons why people get very confused about the book of Revelation. Uh, however, we must just let the scriptures be our guide. If you study Revelation carefully, you will soon realize that it is really basically the Old Testament just expanded upon. And all of these signs and symbols are usually coming from the Old Testament. And that is the situation that we have here. So let's just go through these quickly before we really get into what we're talking about. The first one, the woman clothed with sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. Now, many people in church history have interpreted this as being Mary. If you've ever seen uh, any of the artwork or the statues that you may see in churches of Mary, this is why she's always got kind of glowing lights behind her and stars around her head, because they're using this interpretation here. This is also why on the EU flag you have those stars. Uh, the, the designer of that flag was a Marianne devotee, and this is the influence that we had there. That is one interpretation. Uh, suffice to say, I don't agree with that interpretation, so I'm not going to spend time uh, really refuting that. Let's look uh, at another one that we have here. It's not really Mary. Remember, it's not a literal woman. It's a symbol of something that we have here. If you look to verse 5 in Revelation 12, you get a clue. It says, this woman brings forth a child who will rule the nations with a rod of iron. And that there's your scriptural clue. Remember, Revelation, always quoting parts of the Old Testament. That phrase, ruling the nations with a rod of iron, if you've got your Old Testament heads on, that will take you back to Psalm chapter 2. Let me read it to you. Psalm chapter 2, verse 7 to 9. A messianic psalm. It says, I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. 
He said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and shatter them like earthenware. You see the connection there, the rod of iron. So the, the, the author of Revelation is quoting from Psalm 2 here, making that connection. That should tell us that the child that is being spoken about in the symbolism of Revelation is none other than the one who fulfills Psalm chapter 2. This is the Messiah. It's speaking of Jesus Christ. So this allows us to rule out another very popular interpretation of who this woman and child are. And this is probably the most popular one in the Christian church today. And that is due to the very uh, prevalent but unfortunate influence of what we call replacement theology. Let me give you an example of this. Many of you will be familiar with the theologian N.T. Wright. Uh, he writes many academic books, but he also writes uh, a popular series called his For Everyone series. Let me read to you what he says on this verse. He says, the woman, meanwhile, the faithful people of God, remains in danger. This again can scarcely refer to Mary, so he's correct on that. But then he says, John believes that since Jesus is Israel's Messiah, Israel is redefined around him, so that the woman who flees to the wilderness must be the church itself. And you see what he's done there? Very subtle. Israel redefined around the Messiah, and therefore the church, which is largely Gentile in, uh, in its makeup, is now Israel. And he interprets this uh, as being what the symbolism is. However, we should be able to just rule that out, because there's a problem with saying the woman is the church, because the woman is, bringing f is in labor and is bringing forth the Messiah. Does the church bring forth the Messiah? It's actually completely the opposite way around. Messiah brings forth the church, if you could say it like that. Messiah had to come first, so there's completely got the context wrong, and that helps us to rule out that interpretation too. We know Genesis 12, verse 3, I will bless those who bless you. The one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. That first messianic prophecy that we have, really, not the first, but the, the first explanation of the Abrahamic covenant, teaching us that the Messiah will be the one who blesses all the earth. And obviously, that had to preclude the church, uh, come before the church. So we know it was not the church. It is obviously, in fact, Israel is the correct identification of the woman. The woman is Israel. We've really figured that out just by elimination. We haven't even looked at the actual symbols that are used. But let's do that briefly. The sun, the moon, and the 12 stars. I won't go through this by reading the text, but it comes from Genesis chapter 37. You may be familiar with the famous dream of Joseph uh, his brothers all bowing down to him, and you know the story. Uh, if you read the text there, you'll notice that the symbols of sun, moon, and stars are used to describe um, Jacob and Rachel, and then all of the children, which symbolize the 12 tribes of Israel, which, of course, is a very simple identification with Israel, which makes perfect sense. Israel brought forth the Messiah, and the Messiah brought forth the church. So that is very clearly what we are dealing with here in Revelation chapter 12, the Messiah bringing uh, Israel, bringing the Messiah into the world. So let's go back to verse 3. It says, Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. So who is this second dragon? This is, of course, much easier to identify for us. There's not really much debate about that. Uh, you can read down in verse 9, and it says it very clearly for you. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan the one who deceives the world. It says he was thrown down to earth and his angels were thrown down with him. The dragon is the devil, Satan. He is the one behind all of these things. This is the peering behind the veil into the unseen war that we have here, that great dragon, the serpent of old. And that serpent of old expression there is a reference back to Genesis chapter 3. So that should take you back to that event in your mind. And what was the way, what was the main strategy that Satan used to deceive mankind originally, Adam and Eve. It was deception really, wasn't it? And undermining the authority of the word of God by saying, has God really said this? That is the way he did it then. That is still really very much the way he operates now. And this is where the standoff between the woman and the dragon begun in many ways and has been going on for all of earth's history. The devil, the diablos, the accuser, the slanderer of the saints, the one who deceives the whole world. And think about that statement. That's a pretty uh, exhaustive statement. He deceives the whole world. And you look around at the world today, and you have to agree with that statement, don't you? I, I just cannot believe the things that we are confused over in the world today. 
it seems like the world has really collectively dismissed common sense, if we could say it like that, uh, which is shocking because you kind of think you don't even need to be a believer necessarily to see these things, but that is where we are. And that is because the unseen war is operating behind the scenes. The great deceiver, the serpent of old, is working behind the scenes. He deceives the whole world. Satan tells us this, 1 John 5, 3. We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we see this deception working its way through the Bible, starting with Eve and spreading to all the nations through history. This is the unseen war. Let's look at verse 4. It says, And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. So let me summarize. I, I won't get into the debate about the stars um, today. It's the second part I really want to focus on for the sake of time. But let me summarize the story of this symbolism for you so far. And then we can apply it to the real world, which is always illuminating. The woman, Israel, was created to bring forth the Messiah who would one day defeat the dragon, Satan, who controls and deceives this fallen world as it stands. And the dragon, in his long-standing war with God, knew his adversary one day would come. It was prophesied right in the book of Genesis. He knew one day his head would be crushed by the coming seed. He knew that. So from the beginning, the dragon has anticipated the arrival of the Messiah who sought to stop his plan. And really, you can understand the whole Bible uh, through those two narratives that we have going on there. God's promise to bring a Messiah into the world through Israel and Satan's attempt to stop it. You can understand the whole Bible, really, with those two narratives, and you can understand much of what has happened in history and in the world today. This is what I'm calling the unseen war. And, of course, we have the Bible. We know how it ends. But if it is true, which we very much assert that the Bible is authoritative and true in every area that it addresses, we should be able to look through history and see a correspondence to the reality that we have in the Bible. Because if it is true, it should speak into the real world. That is what the Bible does. And, yes, we do. However, I would say most people are blind to it because we do not use spiritual eyes or have a biblical glasses on that show us the world through the eyes of God. And unfortunately, Christians often make this mistake too, and sometimes we see issues through the lens of culture, uh, peer pressure or politics, whatever it may, may be, and this is everything that puts us into the category of at risk of being deceived by the great deceiver, because he is in charge of those things in many ways. Therefore, we must have the word of God at the forefront. But let's go through this a little bit, and I'll show you what I mean. To start, when did Satan first hear about the male child that would destroy him? I read it to you, uh, I said it already. Genesis 3, I'll read it to you. 3.15 particularly, the proto-evangelum. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise you on the head and, uh, and you shall bruise him on the heel. That's Genesis chapter 3. This is the beginning. At that moment, the unseen war was kind of uh, flicked into gear and it started running its course. The very next chapter, we see it starting to happen. Remember, Satan wants to stop that person coming who will ruin his plan. So he wants to destroy the lineage that will lead to the Messiah. So far, all he knows that it's going to be one of these people coming from Adam and Eve, yes? So what is it that you see in Genesis chapter 4? The very next event that we have in Scripture. Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Now, you want to see behind what's happening in the physical. We know from the text that, that Cain was jealous of, of his uh, brother's offering being accepted, but I want you to look at the unseen war behind it, because behind the physical, there's always the spiritual going on. The spiritual was Satan's unseen war. He wanted to stop the lineage of, of Christ going on there. We know Satan knew Cain was his, so to speak, because it says Cain was of the evil one. We have that in 1 John, and it says Abel was righteous. So think of it from Satan's perspective. He knows Cain is his, Abel is righteous. Who's most likely to bring forth the Messiah? Which line is the Messiah going to come from? The righteous line. So what does he do? I'll get Cain to kill Abel straight away. That's what we have going on here, and this is the start of it. And you see this play out throughout the whole of Scripture. You come to Genesis chapter 6, that unusual chapter that most people debate about the Nephilim and these sorts of things. Understand it in light of the unseen war. It's nothing else going on except another attempt to break up and corrupt that lineage that will bring forth the Messiah. Now we get to Genesis 12, and the promise was narrowed down. It wasn't just the seed of the woman anymore. It was now narrowed down to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
the nation of Israel who would bring forth the Messiah. So thus we see a shift and they now become the target of Satan's unseen war. We see it immediately in Exodus 1, don't we? The Pharaoh orders the Hebrew midwives to kill all of the male children, throw them into the Nile. Again, understand, Pharaoh, in his physical sense, in the human sense, he was concerned about the growing population of foreign people within his nation, and he thought we want to decrease the population. Behind that is the unseen war. Satan wants to stop the Messiah coming in, so he has to kill the lion. These two things going on concurrently gives us a good example of how the physical and the spiritual play together in this world. One time Satan came very close. You remember the story in 2 Chronicles 22, Athaliah, Ahaz, Ahaziah's mother. She attempted to wipe out the royal heirs of Judah, and she, became, she came very close. All but one were killed. Remember Joash was, was scurried away and hidden, and he survived, continuing that line. That again is the unseen war. The story of Esther, same thing again. A wicked man, Haman, plans to exterminate the Jewish race. You could go through the whole Bible like this. Let's move into the time of the Greeks, Antiochus Epiphanes, the Maccabean Rebellion. All of these things are plans to exterminate the Jews, to expel the Jews, to persecute the Jews, and expel them from Jerusalem. However, brings us up to the first century, he didn't manage to stop the birth of the Messiah. But again, we see his hand in the attempt by Herod to destroy all of the babies in Bethlehem. Remember again, Herod's motivation, he'd fought long and hard for that throne. He killed a lot of his own family members for that throne. He wasn't going to let anyone take that throne. And he, killing the babies in Bethlehem was no big thing for Herod, if you know anything about Herod. Behind that again, the unseen war, Satan's attempt to stop the Messiah coming into the world or kill the Messiah uh, when he, after he was born. However, imagine how Satan thought when he finally got Jesus on the cross, thinking that he had just done the ultimate move, that he was about to win. Little did he know the Lord was in charge of all of this. He didn't fail to prevent it. And then his strategy moved. He knows ultimately the Messiah will crush him. He knows ultimately now the Messiah is resurrected and glorified, but will return to do that crushing when Israel repents in the last days. That's a big theme of the Bible. We see it all through Revelation and many of the uh, major prophets in the Bible. In Revelation 11, it says, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Now, what that scripture is declaring is that Satan's attempt is gone by that point. He knows that is it. Time is up. He is lost. He's been served his notice, and the seed is going to come back and crush his head, and his destiny will ultimately be the lake of fire, or chaining for a thousand years, and then the lake of fire. He wants to prevent this. So again, now, he focuses his attack on Israel, because he knows it is Israel's repentance in many ways that petitions the Lord to come. And I'm referring to the second coming here, not the rapture of the saints. I'm referring to the second coming, which is when this happens. Jewish history, however, is replete with examples of an attempt to exterminate that nation. They've been hounded and persecuted across their dispersion more than any other people group in the world. This in itself is a corroboration that the story we have in the Bible is true. This should tell us that the unseen war is still uh, raging in this world. And it also affirms to us the truth of the scriptures for us. However, unfortunately, the church is very confused on this issue. And many times it seems that the church has been Satan's greatest weapon in trying to fulfill his unseen war. We call this replacement theology, supersessionism, basically anti-Judaism, anti-Semitism, whatever you want to call it. Unfortunately, the church has been one of the biggest offenders in this. Uh, I've written a lot on this. I'm not going to plug my own books, but I have got a book written on this subject that is all about the unseen war. Uh, I did plug my own book, but uh, <laughs> that was the plan originally. But. Let me just give you a brief background. The third century, this is when replacement theology, that is the view that the church has replaced Israel, like what I read to you there from N.T. Wright, uh, that Israel is done away with. That entered the church, and it has led to much shameful history. It teaches that God is finished. There's no longer any plan or purpose for them. Of course, you should be able to just read the scriptures and understand this view is not accurate because many times it talks about the return of Jesus being preconditioned upon the second coming, remember I'm referring to, being preconditioned upon the repentance of Israel. Let me give you just a historical example. Just last year, we had, just because we're in the UK now, we had the, uh, the 800th anniversary of the Synod of Oxford. And also because we are in Oxford right now, I thought this would be a good example. And there was a small little service done in Oxford, a, a repentance service basically. But if you don't know, the Synod of Oxford, 1222, this was a church council that made canon law for England. It was convened by the Archbishop of Canterbury at the time, Stephen Langton. 
You may know that name. He's responsible for the Magna Carta, a very good document in British history. He's also the person responsible for the chapter and verses in your Bible that you have there. So we still have his influence today. However, what most people don't realize, it was this synod, synod that originally instituted the notorious badge of shame for English Jews. This was the forerunner to the yellow star that we see so prominently in the Holocaust times. This synod also said that Jews had to pay tithes to the churches. It prohibited the building of synagogues. It stopped social interaction between Jews and Christians, and Jews were banned from going out in public over the Christian holidays. And this eventually led to the Jewish expul uh, expulsion from England in 1290, where all Jews were expelled from England. Let's jump forward now in history. This is only a very brief survey to the 20th century. I believe, like no other time in history, we see the unseen war break forth with the rise of National Socialism in Germany. Hitler's final solution to annihilate the Jewish population, and he almost succeeded again, over six million murdered in the Holocaust. The Holocaust, I believe, can teach us a lot about the strategies of Satan, especially in the last days. One thing you need to do is when you look at that, I believe many of the strategies of Satan were on show for the world at that point. This is the spirit of Antichrist that we've already said, that John said is here already and will be here again in the last days. Understand what Hitler had to do to be able to do. He had to use politics, he had to use science, and he had to use religion to come to power. Those three things. And what are the three things you see being manipulated in the world today? It's those three, those three things, isn't it? They are his greatest weapons still. All were used in that old serpent method, that great deceptive power that he had. He rose to power and then he took over the law courts, the parliament. They called it the Enabling Act, which is where he basically sent his troops into the parliament so that no one would vote. He intimidated them, uh, things like that. And they passed the laws where he was given dictatorial power and then he could do what he wanted. And this, again, is something I see going on in many of the law courts around the world today with those same three things happening. Satan, by his use of secular governments, by his use of a false Christianity, false religion, by ultimately one day it will be by the lies of one very charismatic leader, and he's going to try again to fulfill his unseen war. He's been trying to do this really ever since Eden. And this is what we have going on. In the final days of the period before the second coming of Christ, he will still be trying to fulfill that plan. Let's look at verse 10 in Revelation chapter 12. It says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before God day and night. For this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. And when the dragon saw, verse 13, uh, saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children. That's obviously referring to the future time, but I see we see that same spirit and that same plan going on in the visceral hatred that you see towards the Jewish people in Israel today. And don't be mistaken, in olden times they used to just say it plainly, it was the Jews we hated. These days they try and uh, make it a little bit more deceptive and just use the term Israel, and somehow that's politi politically more expedient for their purposes. Uh, but I believe it's the same thing ultimately. When you really dig into it, most examples that I've seen, it is the same thing going on here. But this is very true. Almost 47% of the Jewish population believe that another Holocaust is soon coming for them just from the feel in the air and the rise of anti-Semitism, which in itself should tell us that is a sign of the last days. For exactly these reasons that I'm telling you, because of the unseen war, Satan knows his time is short and he's stepping up his purposes. We see this all around the world. Just earlier this year, 2023, Iran, always making threats against Israel, they released their Khyber busting missile. This is a long-range missile, and in case the reference is lost on you, Khyber was an ancient Jewish town in the Arabian Peninsula that was overrun by Muhammad and his forces in the 7th century, uh, and the Jews were all completely slaughtered, and there's no longer a Jewish uh, town there. That is Khyber. So their naming of that missile is very uh, focused there. But think about this, and I give you many, many more examples of things like that, but I want you to try and think about the perspective from the unseen war going on behind the scenes here from Revelation 12. Think about this. Satan knows when Jesus returns at the second coming in power and glory, he will be chained for a thousand years for the time of the kingdom and then ultimately his destiny is the lake of fire. He also knows 
that Satan, uh, that Jesus, sorry, will return to Jerusalem. We find that in the scriptures, in Zechariah and in Matthew and many places. And he also knows that he will return to Jerusalem when the Jews in Jerusalem petition him to return. Therefore, it is an eschatological necessity that there are Jewish people in Jerusalem at that time. You understand that? That's an important point. However, think about this from the unseen war. Satan knows all those things. And what has he done? He's managed to surround that tiny piece of land with a religion and nations that adhere to a belief that is ultimately for the desire and destruction of Israel. That doesn't happen by coincidence. That happens by the unseen war. The, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. You see, that is what we have going on behind the scenes. We have to have our biblical glasses on and the world makes a lot more sense. But let us also remember, having looked at this, Satan has not ever and will not be able to thwart the promises of God. The Messiah was born, he was sacrificed for our sins, and he rose again, defeating death. He is glorified right now. All power, glory, and authority are given to him, and Satan cannot even stand the bright and glory of his coming. He couldn't destroy the, the Jews. He couldn't destroy the nation of Israel. And as long as the sun and the moon and the stars are shining, he will not be able to. He won't be able to stop the second coming. That one who is to rule the nations with a rod of iron will come, and Satan himself will not be able to avoid the lake of fire. That is the unseen war. We are blessed. We know the ending. Therefore, that should motivate us to go out, stand for truth. As Jack was saying, speak boldly the gospel, rescue as many as we can from the fire. Now, what do we do in the interim? Right now, here, as the church, with our mission to be salt and light, firstly, we must recognize the spiritual battle for what it is, spiritual warfare. But we must understand that properly and biblically. So what must we do? Let me give you a few practical things that we can glean from this text and a few other places. It says in verse 11, and they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. These are two things that the church should have at the forefront of its focus, preaching the blood of the lamb and telling the testimony of Jesus Christ, preaching the gospel, getting people saved and preaching the gospel is the first way to really defeat and enter into this battle with the unseen war. And how do we make sure that we do not get deceived by such schemes? This great deceiver, Sir Satan, he is very good at that, make no mistake, and he has fooled the church many times in history. We are told not to be ignorant of his schemes. 2 Corinthians 2, so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. Too often I look around at the cultural wars going on and the way the church is engaging, and it's very clear we are ignorant of his schemes in many ways. And the reason is we've fallen for that very first tactic, has God really said? That's where we fall over most of the time. It seems so simple, but the Satan is good. Don't underestimate him. We must have, however, uh, let me read to you Ephesians 6, 1. This is your armor to counteract that deception. Be strong in the Lord, in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. The full armor of God, the word of God, the understanding of your faith, your salvation, truth, all of these things you read in Ephesians 6 are your safeguard against this. This is why you've probably heard pastors say many times, pray and get into the word. Those are not cliches. That is really what we are given to arm ourselves and enter into this battle. Ephesians 6.18, his final piece of advice, the Apostle Paul to his church, he says, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit and with this on, in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. So what do we do? We understand the importance of the blood of the lamb. We understand the importance of the gospel and the word of his testimony. We understand the importance of our relationship with him in prayer. And we understand the authority of the word of God. And we hold on to those things for dear life and preach them like our life depends on it. And that is really what we are called to do here as a church. And in the context of this session that we've read uh, in Revelation 12, we must also, as part of that, understand the scriptures as they pertain to Israel. And we are called to intercede for Israel because that is one area where the spiritual battle is very easy to identify. Paul says that we should pray for the people of Israel. What do we pray specifically? Firstly, we pray that they would meet the Messiah. 
That is one of the first things we pray, that they would know and understand and believe on Yeshua, their Messiah. And then we pray for the church to not be deceived, not to fall into the history of anti-Semitism that we have, to understand the role and purposes of Israel in the plan of God as revealed to us in the scriptures. And we do those things, and then it says that we will make Israel jealous when we show our relationship with the Messiah, and that will cause them to come to him. And this leads us up into the time of Revelation. And I just suggest that we all study that. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Uh, If you have any questions, I'll be over on the stool for the Ezra Foundation. Please come and talk to me. Let's commit this time to the Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word, for the light that it is in this dark world, Lord God. And I pray that you would help us to put it down deep into our hearts, Lord, that we would live it out practically uh, in this world. I pray for everyone here, Lord, you'd fill us with your spirit and empower us to do that. And pray your blessing upon the rest of this conference too. In Jesus' name, for his sake we pray. Amen. Yeah.